Angel is brought to you by NetSuite from Oracle, the only system you need to run your business. Go to netsuite.com slash angel to get your free guide called Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Angel, the podcast. This is the podcast where we talk to early stage investors, sometimes early stage VCs, sometimes angels. We'll explain what the difference between those two things are. And uh, I am an angel investor in over 150 companies. Six of them became unicorns. That's a one in 25 uh, track record. If you're counting, I certainly am. And uh, you can read all about that in my book, angelthebook.com. Angel investing is risky. But it's also exciting, and it's one of the most interesting places you can have a career because you get to hang out with the people who are trying to change the world, literally trying to make the world bend to their vision. And even if the job was an hourly salaried uh, employment, I'd probably still do it. It's a really exciting job, and I encourage you to read up on early stage investing in startups because it could change your life. And I detail that all in the book. Now, the purpose of this podcast is to act as a continuation of the discussion in the book of the best practices of early stage investing. Early stage investing has been a bit of alchemy. It's been something that hasn't really been thought about as a discipline or even as a career. But as time has gone on and the number of uh, startups has increased and the number of angel investors have increased, early stage investing is starting to have discipline just like venture capital has, which is a very disciplined uh, type of... Um, Endeavor. So my guest today is Clara Brenner. She is uh, the co-founder of the Urban Innovation Fund, and I met her here in Silicon Valley, I don't know, four or five years ago? Yeah, that's Something right. like that. Yeah. And we've invested in a couple of companies together. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Uh, so how did you get into early stage investing, and why did you get into it? What attracted you to it? Uh, by accident, yeah. I uh, found my way to investing. So actually, my background's in commercial real estate development. I thought I wanted to start my own development firm, so I went back to business school. Um, and between my first and second year, I ended up getting a job at a real estate tech company just for fun. I thought it would be something I could do over the summer. Um, it ended up becoming a really amazing business called Fundrise, which essentially crowdfunds dollars from the community to invest in institutional real estate. Within that community, they went on to raise about $50 million. They're huge. They're across the US. And wow. um, similarly, my really good friend at business school, Julie, was having a super transformative experience working for a company called Revolution Foods. At the time, it really was a startup. Now it's a really big company. I think they do like 200 million in annual revenue. This is a, wow. a healthy school meal provider. Mm. Um, this was like when Lyft was just getting off the ground and Airbnb. And uh, we felt like all of these companies had something in common. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily self-identify as impact companies in any way, but they were solving really interesting community challenges and they were scaling in ways that traditional community organizations don't tend to do. Mm. Um, and we were wondering why all of our awesome, thoughtful, engaged peers at business school all seem to be starting uh, companies not in this space. I think we had like four photo sharing apps come out of our class of 400. Yeah, wow. And there's no knock on photo sharing apps. I love them. I have many of them. But it was interesting like that they thought that there was opportunity in some spaces and not in other spaces. Um, so we ended up, like the nerds that we are, kind of doing a research study around companies in the space, what we started calling urban innovators. So startups tackling really you know, meaningful challenges in cities in a highly scalable way. And what we found is that they have a lot of things in common. Uh, first, it's really hard to raise early stage capital. Hmm. Um, a lot of these businesses have a physical component to what they do. So you know, if you're a bike share, you need a fleet of bikes. If you're a Revolution Foods, you need a physical culinary center. Um, or maybe you're operating in some kind of new economy or sharing economy economy type space, in which case more institutional investors want to see that you have more traction before they're going to take a risk on you. So that's sort of like big challenge number one. Big challenge number two is that they operate in really highly regulated or at least highly politicized spaces. So if you're that bike share system, you need public space permits. Um, if you're a Revolution Foods, you're selling into highly regulated school districts. If you're Uber, you're like breaking every law known to man. You know, there's just a certain level to which- Reinterpreting. You know, that's fine, but there's a certain level to which, and you, you integrated can, laws. <laughs> fair. I think, yeah. I think in some cases it's true. It, yeah. Totally true. Yeah. Regardless of how you choose to engage, you yeah. have to engage in order right. to be successful. Um, and as we surveyed the landscape, it was pretty clear there weren't any investors out there investing in this space in a concerted way. And they certainly weren't giving a, many startups uh, good right. regulatory or political advice. Um, so we ended up taking our research to Blackstone when we graduated and basically mm -hmm. saying we think there would be some value to create 
creating a showcase investment portfolio of all startups doing great things for the community while also pursuing market rate returns um, mm -hmm. with the goal of kind of educating more institutional investors that they could start aligning their investment practices a little bit more closely with their organizational objectives. Um, so that's what we did. We launched an accelerator called Tummel that had an investment component. Um, so we incubated like 38 companies out of out of that entity. So we were the first investors in Chariot, for example, which is a commuter shuttle that was acquired by Ford last year-ish. Yeah. Um, or Neighborly, which is like a crowd investing platform for, for municipal bonds. We just found that our portfolio did really well from a, both a business perspective as well as a lot of really interesting other metrics. So like 76% um, of the companies we invested in have a woman or person of color on the founding team, which is really, really unusual. What, what percentage? 76. 76. And it's not, that was intentional? Or? No, that was not part of our selection wow. process. Um, I think it kind of speaks to some of the positive externalities that come from having other people at the table when making these decisions. So yeah. anyway, that, that what, what you mean by that is having two female founders for your fund. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so that, that success kind of encouraged us to kind of take it to the next level and launch a fund, which is what we did last year. It's called the Urban Innovation Fund. Oh, so congratulations on that. Thank you. you. You talked a little bit about how hard it is to do these city-based startups, if we'll call them that, these urban-based startups. Sure. And I just recently heard about, uh, you brought up bike sharing. There is a scooter sharing in Santa Monica, California, in Los Angeles. There's one here too. Oh, is there? Well, there's... The um, scoot, scoot, yeah. I'm talking about the scooters that are like the ones you stand on. Oh yeah. I don't know what the difference is. I mean, there's a, there's electric scooters which are like mopeds or Vespas, and then there's these electric scooters. Yeah. But Santa Monica is literally like in a war with them, saying they're illegal, but I guess they're still doing it. Yeah. Um, and so, what is the advice when the laws maybe are unclear? What is your best advice to those startups? And then how do you think about it as an investor? Okay, this startup could change the world, Airbnb, right. Uber, Lyft, or let's say this scooter, uh, but <laughs> the rules maybe don't explicitly allow for it. Sure. So therefore, we're going to try it, but we could get shut down. How do you account for that and think about it as an investor, that risk? Yeah. I mean... So I think you hit the nail on the head. So many of the most highly valued private startups today are operating in these highly regulated, highly politicized spaces. Uh, for us, it's it's a focus of ours. We don't want to shy away from those types of businesses. Depending upon the issue that they're working on, yeah. it, it, our approach might differ. Um, but I think generally we try to encourage a pretty collaborative approach with larger community, maybe larger business entities, I think a good example. So uh, when Chariot first came to us, they didn't even have a single van on the street. Right. So we worked with them from day one to think about, you know, do we hire full-time drivers or do we hire, you know, part-time drivers? Do we um, tell the supervisors what we're doing? Do we not tell them what we're doing? You know, the supervisors being the government supervisors correct. of the neighborhoods. Correct. And so we, we basically said like everybody else in this space, and it was a pretty crowded space, um, is doing it one way and we're going to do it a different way. So they hired full-time drivers. They integrated with public benefits programs like WageWorks. So, you know, to drive the cost down and, and sort of integrate with community programming, they rolled out routes in areas where it was clear they were servicing community members that were otherwise underserved by public transit. And they mm -hmm. told this story in a really compelling way to regulators. And it wasn't clear what was allowed or what wasn't, but there were certain rules. And so like they made sure that they they chose vans that were regulated differently than say some of the really large shuttles that Got have gotten it. a lot of trouble. So I think there's a lot you can do to both avoid getting in trouble, but also take advantage of like, if you are smart and you engage, there are ways to just succeed. And, you know, they ended up being the last bus sort of startup standing and that really yeah. worked in their favor. Yeah. And, and when they did launch here, Chariot in San Francisco, they were going to routes that were under service. Correct. And so the city, if they did have a complaint, would have had to face the ire of the consumers who were benefiting from it. And I think there's something to that. If, if the consumer benefit is so great and you get them on your side early yeah. and they're mobilized, then you can use them as a proof point to those regulators and say, listen, you know, there's a group of people who really are enjoying this and it's good for the city because of these reasons. And uh, I think Uber did that in a super aggressive way with de Blasio in New York saying, hey, de yeah. Blasio wants to cap the number of Ubers or Lyfts. Right. Here's his phone number. <laughs> but, you know, even more subtly, if 
people are um, in favor of Airbnb because they're making a living from it, those Airbnb hosts are going to show up for you at City Hall if need be. Totally. Or write the letters. I think it's not just thinking of them as consumers, but as constituents. You know, yeah. if you stakeholders, right? Stakeholders. Yeah. And so it's about, you know, activating them in the appropriate way. And of course, not every company is going to do it the same way. We, you know, don't make our companies take one approach or the other, but we try to help them think from, you know, very early on, you know, we should at least have a strategy. Yeah. Let's talk about the deal size and the stage you want to invest in with Urban Innovation Fund. What deal size are you trying to and what stage you're trying to invest in? Uh, so we're a pre-seed and seed stage investor. So we're typically writing initial checks somewhere between 100 and 500K, but we do like to follow along. Mm. So follow along means what in this context? It depends. I mean, I think these days, you know, there isn't the sort of logical leap from seed to series A. There's pre-seed and then seed and then seed two. And, you know, so I think for us, it's about whatever round comes next. You know, if we have faith that there is, you know, real momentum behind the company, we, we want to show our support. Yeah. And you don't want to invest in a company, if what I'm hearing correctly, that you don't think can clear the next hurdle. Do you think about that when you're making an investment? Like, hmm, if I give this company 500K and another investor puts in 500K like me or whoever, okay, well, that million dollars get them to the point where a larger venture capital firm will do a proper Series A. Is that on your mind? Can they hit that milestone? How will they clear market? I think you have to as a responsible investor. I mean, there are some companies that may never raise additional capital and that would be fantastic for us. But I think realistically speaking, you know, most of the companies that we encounter here in Silicon Valley are um, going to need an additional injection of capital. And so like you have to think about what's going to come next. I mean, we're capable of writing additional checks, but we're not going to fill up a whole series A. And so understanding and building, making sure the company is building the right company to you know be attractive is important. What do you look for? And I know this is like the generic question we all get as investors. Yeah. But in terms of the personality of the founder, is that important? Are there things you look for in a founder? Or do you think many different personality types can win? And there's other things you look for as well? Certainly different personality types. But I think for us, we always talk about a big vision and an ability to execute. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, this has been our buzzword around the office lately, momentum. It's mm. not just about, you don't have to have a million customers and be making a million dollars as a pre-seed company, but we want to see that every time we talk to you, something is happening. Your product has, has grown and improved. You've you know taken steps to make your business better, and, and that's really what's exciting to us. And so that's really what we look for when we, we talk to companies. Some type of action going on, like yeah. the, the founder can make things happen or the founding team can make things happen with or without your investment, things are moving forward. Totally. And sometimes that's best indicated by revenue and sometimes it's not. It really depends upon the company. Hmm. What other factors beyond revenue do you think are critical when you're making your decision? I mean, Some people talk about market size and TAM and total addressable market. What do you all of for? those things are important. We have an associate who's really militant about market sizing and hmm. she's great at that. And you know, for us, we look at all of those sort of traditional factors, whether it's total market size, the types of customers you're servicing. We also look at things like team culture. I think mm. being intentional about the kinds of people you're hiring, the kind of culture you're creating, the kind of office you're building. You could just be two people or even one person, but even then, like what kind of thought are you putting into making this big, huge? Mm. Because ultimately we feel like that's such a, a tremendous part about what, what's going to make a company successful or not. And I think it's really undervalued. How they build a culture that can scale. Correct. And if how, I'm hearing correctly. Yeah. How uh, culture to scale and also commitment to the business. I actually had an interesting conversation with an investor yesterday who um, would say th like they they had kind of a multi tier selection process, and he was saying that um, they'll bring a company in regardless of sort of how excited they are about it. And they'll say, you know, we really liked your first pitch, but actually we had a, an investor in the back who saw your pitch and he actually is not really interested in the business you're doing, but we'll give you a million dollars if you switch to some other thing, like go open a bodega or, you know, a chain <laughs> or something and to see their reaction. Oh my God. Um, that which is, is so, it's so mean. It's yeah. so cool. But they'll, um, they take that very seriously. I'm not saying that that's what we do, but I, th yeah. I think it is important to sort of say like, how committed are you to like really making this real? Because we are going to spend our nights and weekends thinking about your business. Are you wow. going to be doing that as Super well? Super gut check time. Yeah. 
That's amazing. Don't worry, I, I would never ask that. <laughs> <laughs> I really like you. However, yeah. I have a friend who's a model. Yeah. And he is really like a PhD in neuroscience and a model. Yeah. Would you like me to introduce you to him instead of me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, hmm. <laughs> Okay. I don't actually have that friend. <laughs> How dare you? Yeah. That's a really sinister, manipulative, Machiavelli. I love it. Yeah, it's super it's Machiavellian. It's dark. I like it. Um, but it is, there is something to how committed are you to this? Yeah. Because in both of our experience, I think it is incredibly hard what founders do. Totally. And they have no idea in many cases exactly how hard it would be. In fact, if they did... I think we see half as many entrepreneurs, if they knew maybe two thirds less, if they knew exactly how hard it was going to be. Yeah. How do you deal with founders who are on the precipice of failure? It becomes obvious to you, I think, through your signaling and having done, I don't know, well over 50 investments at this point, I, I think you probably know this is going to end and it's not going to end well. How do you deal with that with the founder? What do you say to them in those dark times when you know it's... Oof, it's going down. It's a hard conversation. I yeah. think we try generally not to be the ones to call it. I think ultimately, mm. if it's your business, it's your decision. Mm. We're there as a sort of listening ear. I mean, for us as a fund, we stay in really close communication with our companies. So we talk to them at least once a month. Our associate checks in with them more regularly and does a lot of sort of projects with our company. So we're mm. talking to them all the time. And usually we have a sense, you know, in advance if things seem to be in a challenging place. Um, we try to encourage, you know, our entrepreneurs to talk to us, but, you know, ultimately it's about helping them wind down in a responsible manner and, you know, take care of their employees, talk to their investors and make sure they're thinking about all the potential exit opportunities that are available. Because I think a lot of entrepreneurs just think, well, you know, Ugh, this is done. I'm going to just leave this. And, you know, there's a lot of value on the table. And so, you know, making sure you're there is a sort of helpful outside perspective to kind mm. of make sure they're thinking clearly because it's, it's sucks. It's a really shitty situation to be in. It is, isn't it? And, yeah. uh, you know, oftentimes you're not thinking straight. You can lose it in that death spiral when the plane is, you know, spiraling. Totally. And you don't know what to do. So you're pulling up when in fact you need speed and you should be pulling down, but you're actually stalling the plane. Totally. In a lot of cases, people get paralyzed. And a lot of times the the investors can shake them out of that, I find. Absolutely. But we try never to count companies out because frankly, yeah. some of the exits we've had have been really surprising and companies where you're like, really? <laughs> that company? <laughs> really? Yeah. But it, it's they worked out They were out of well. money and they just and yeah, it worked didn't out. raise for three years and then all of a sudden it works out. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. I, I have a very... I've been trying to manage it because as an investor, you also have to manage your own psychology and you start to learn this. And I, I'm a bad loser <laughs> and I don't like giving up. Yeah. And when I see how easily some people are ready to throw in the towel, yeah, it really can infuriate me like, or just tweak me to a way, it tilts me, in a, yeah. you know, to use the poker term when I'm like, well, there's three months of salary, you have three months of runway left and God, there's such a good team here and- Somebody would buy this company and we could get the investors back their money. And they're like, yeah, we're going to just give everybody their laptops and we're going to pay some banker to sell the assets. But yeah, we're done. And I mean, I think for us, the thing to remember is always that company is not going to be driving the returns of our fund regardless. Yeah. And so, you know, staying focused on the businesses that ultimately are going to be, you know, exploding mm -hmm. with growth. Those are the ones ultimately we have to remind ourselves about when we get really upset about, <laughs> you know, some... Tilted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely... Tilting. I'm I'm learning to manage this. Yeah. Do you have any leaks in your game as it would as it is like as an investor where you just have to manage yourself when you're looking at the business and saying, I could solve this problem or this is solvable, but they're not doing what you think is an obvious solution. How do you deal with that? And and what other things have you learned now, 50 or so investments in? I think you're at 50 or 60. Uh, a little less than that, but yeah. yes. Um, the thing for us, the thing well, what that- What about I, you, yeah. The thing for me is that I'm lucky enough to have a really amazing co-founder. Julie is a perfect compliment to me. And oh. I think in areas where I am strong, she's less strong and where she's super strong, I am less strong. And mm -hmm. you know, one of her great characteristics is being- uh, super optimistic and super, uh, uh sort of 
focused on keeping things positive. And so mm. sometimes, you know, I'll want to ask a bunch of really hard hitting questions and she, you know, steps in and, and sort of says, how are you feeling? You know, to the <laughs> entrepreneur, I think that's really important. I think it's really good to know your strengths and weaknesses and surround yourself with people who can make sure you balance out because sometimes you need someone to ask those hard questions and that's where I'm stepping in. Yeah. Um, but, um, it, for me, that's the best part about having a co-founder. Yeah, it's, it is, there's always a judgment call there when you're working with a founder of, is this founder emotionally ready to hear these questions or to discuss this really pressing issue? Or is this going to be the thing that cracks them? Because they're under such an unbelievable amount of stress. H how do you suggest founders manage this? Or is it just that some people shouldn't be founders and that we have a lot of people joining and starting companies who really don't have, you know, the resiliency necessary to be a founder. I think that's part of it. Yeah. Um, but I also think there are, you know, processes and procedures that both investors and entrepreneurs can put in place to, to be better. You know, I think, um, you know, understanding what your key metrics are and just tracking towards them and not getting distracted by all of these other random details that are out there and just sort of saying, you know, as long as I'm moving forward on these things, I should feel fine. You know, I think there is, at least for me personally, I find those types of tracking tools really helpful because mm. it allows you to stay focused on the things that matter. Um, yeah. but that's just me. Yeah. I think if you're not focused on a metric, that probably means you don't understand your business or your business isn't constructed in a way that's thoughtful. Yeah. Uh, do you find most businesses find their key metrics early or is that something that people need to do a better job of, generally speaking? I think in entrepreneurs generally need to do a better job of that. I think the companies that we try to pick are doing it well. Um, mm. Those are things you can figure out in advance. Um, but we also are really... Um, How would you figure that out in advance if the person has got that level of detail? I mean, these are the kind of things they should be talking about at their presentation. Like, what are you thinking about? What are your plans for the next year? Um, you know, how do you envision your revenue growth? You know, what are you focused on for the next six months, 12 months? Where do you need to be to get to a series A? Like those types of questions can help you suss out, you know, how are, how are they mm -hmm. thinking about their goals and, and, um, how they're going to reach them? Do they even have a plan? Right. I mean, right. it's amazing sometimes to say, Hey, what, what will this money accomplish if we invest a million dollars in this company? What will the company look like after you deploy that million? Totally. And I've heard you talk about this before. It's not just, you know, what are you going to do with the money, but what are you going to achieve with the money? It's not, yeah. I'm going to hire two developers. It's, I'm going to be able to make these adjustments to our product as a result of bringing on two yeah. developers. Or I'm going to have three be. anchor reference clients. I'm, right. I'm going to have three of six management team positions filled, you know, and the, the series A or the seed extension will fill in two more. Exactly. Yeah, and we'll get there. Okay. When we get back from this quick break, I want to talk to you a little bit about, um, your portfolio and talk about some of the great companies you invested in and why, and maybe even some of the ones that didn't work out that are just heartbreaking to you. <laughs> and we'll go through some of the great misses because I, there's so many lessons in those, sure. I, I feel, when we get back on Angel the Podcast. Let me take a moment to thank NetSuite by Oracle. Thank you, NetSuite from Oracle, for supporting season two of Angel, the podcast, and the results are in. Survey Inc.'s 5,000 companies show that the top barriers to growth are that it takes finance too long to close the books and that companies are too slow to launch new products, hiring and keeping good people, managing cash, and too many disconnected systems. It's very hard when your business grows to get a full picture of that business. And if, you, if this sounds familiar to you, it's probably because you've outgrown your business and financial management system. QuickBooks and spreadsheets are fine in the early days of a business. We've all been there. But it's probably now taking you two or three or 10 times uh, as long to get simple things done and to get accurate answers about your business. And that's why you should know about NetSuite from Oracle. NetSuite is one, is the one system that tracks and manages revenue, cash flow, HR, inventory, projects, even e-commerce for every industry. And that's what's important here. NetSuite is working across all industries and it is a phenomenal product. Now you can run your business from a dashboard on your phone and you do not have to wait to get these important answers that founders and boards and investors need to know. And that's why thousands of companies use NetSuite. It's the only system you need to run your business. So here's your call to action. I want you to go to netsuite.com slash angel, netsuite.com dot com slash angel and you will get your free guide called 
crushing the five barriers to growth. That's right. Go to netsuite.com slash angel and get crushing the five barriers to growth. That's netsuite.com slash angel, netsuite.com slash angel. Thanks again to NetSuite. And you can go ahead and thank NetSuite as well uh, on your Twitter handle or Facebook for supporting independent media like Angel. We couldn't do it without you. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Angel, the podcast. This is season two, and we're thrilled to bring you Clara Brenner today of the Urban Innovation Fund. Uh, she's invested in maybe 37, 40. I don't know. What's your... 40 something at this yeah. point between Tumble and this. It's, we've supported a lot of companies. Yeah. And when you look back before the break, I asked you to think about some of the misses and some of the great successes. Let's start with some of the pain. <laughs> Because we learn so much in these failures. Is there a company or two that you look back on and say, my God, I wish that that company had made it. It could have made it. And I hope somebody starts that company again. Yeah. The, the sort of regret, like the one that got away that should have succeeded. I mean, I won't name names, but okay. there is, there is, we had one company that we loved. They had this incredibly dynamic uh, woman founder. She had a great technical co-founder. She was really sales oriented. Mm. They built this tremendous product that we felt was really contributing to their specific space. And, um, the co-founder ended up having to leave because he had a surprise family event. Mm. Um, and there's nothing you can do about that. That happens all the time. Um, but it really sent the company into a tailspin. Um, you know, how do you recover from losing a co-founder, let alone a technical co-founder? Um, it just never quite came back. Mm. Um, and that was really upsetting to us. I think we really, we, we had so much faith in this founder. She was super resilient. She was super thoughtful, but ultimately when it came to this challenge, it was, it was really tough to come back from that. And I think, you know, recognizing a redundancy in your team is important, especially from a technical perspective, but B, you know, you have to kind of buckle down and and bring someone on board as quickly as possible and not avoid making decisions, for example, around new hires that Mm. will prevent you from kind of moving on. Sometimes you kind of want to mourn (laughs) and you need to move on quickly. Um, and you know, we just loved this company. We love the team and you know, I can't wait for that founder to start another company. But I think, I think sometimes you, you just, it's the thing you never expected to have happen and it can really throw you for a loop. Especially when the company has six or 12 months of runway. Yeah. You know, it could take three to six months to find this person, the replacement. And so you have to have a massive sense of urgency. Right. And if you let your runway get too short and one of these things happens, my gosh, you know, the there's just not enough altitude uh, in the plane for you right. to correct. You're just flying too low to the ground. I also think being ready to fire people is important. You oh, bring God, people yes. on and you have to be quick to hire and quick to fire. You yeah. know, you've got to try things. You're not always going to get it right. Yeah. Um, but, but I think sometimes you just, you like wish it to be so, and that's not, um, what needs to happen. You need to sort of step outside of yourself and say, this isn't working. I need to find someone else. Almost universally. If you have a doubt about a person on your team, there will be no doubt about what you should do. Yeah. It's like when there's a doubt, there is no doubt about what to do. In almost every case, I, I cannot think of a case where I had doubts about a person yeah. and they weren't fully realized and that I didn't wish I should have cut them off quicker. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. And almost universally, when you find that person in the team and you say, hey, it's not working out. They're like, yeah, totally. Um, how do I get out of here? Yeah. And, and they might be holding on for the wrong reasons. Right. I have some weird sense of loyalty or they're looking for a job, but they want you to, you know, cut it as it would, as it would be. What other lessons have you learned in failure? Are there, are there things that you see as a reoccurring theme that you now warn founders of when you're investing? I mean, I think you and I talk about this a lot, which is just communicating with your investors. Oh, yes. Um, you know, there's always, you hear those stories about a company that just, you get an email one day that says, surprise, we're out of business. And um, those are those are really scary emails to get. And they they make me really angry. And not yeah. that they happen very frequently, but you also hear about them pretty frequently. Yeah. Um, I think there's a certain understanding, like you don't have to be my best friend, but we have a business relationship. Yeah. And you need to talk to me like your business partner, because that's what I am. And so I think, I think all founders should think really carefully about the relationships that they build because it will come back to bite you. This is a, a relatively small community of, yeah. of entrepreneurs and investors and your reputation certainly precedes you. And most people don't send updates. Why? 
what is the reason that you think founders say, ah, I'm, I'm, I'll send one next month as opposed to this month or this moment? Um, cause things are not going well is mm. oftentimes what it is, or at least not where they don't, they're not where they want to be, mm. or they sort of think, Oh, you know, I'm a founder. I have many, many important things to do. And you know, this mm. is just, um, secretarial type work when in yeah. fact, I think, you know, if you're a founder and you don't know this information, that's a real problem. No one's asking you to write a dissertation on your, you know, KPIs, but you know, a, a quick, series of bullets around, you know, this is where I want it to be and this is where I am, um, yeah. can be incredibly, I think, as a gut check for you as a founder, is important to communicate with your investors to get them on board and at least understand where you are. Really important. And I think it also is a great reminder to you as a founder because you can start to communicate that to your team. So when you do hit milestones, you can celebrate because I think so mm. often again, back to this culture question, I don't think a lot of founders spend enough time with their team getting them pumped up, getting them excited, getting yeah. them motivated. You're usually not working at a startup because you're making a zillion dollars right off the bat. It's because right. you you love what you're doing. And so making sure you're cultivating that excitement um, and celebrating little wins is so important because sometimes when you're slaving away, you know, in someone's basement, yeah. uh, it, you know, you sort of think like, why am I doing this again? Right. Um, so I think, I think that's really important. It gives you a, just a chance to reflect. And I think one thing I would tease out of what you said is, if you don't have easy access to the metrics of your business, right. it's almost like being a pilot and you put a piece of cardboard over the dashboard. We keep talking about the plane metaphor, but it's, it's so relevant that if you don't actually have quick, easy access to how many months of runway you have, how many customers you have, what the churn is, you know, how many open positions you have, if you don't right. know what the status of the key metrics of your business are, well, you need to get that tightened up right? <laughs> uh, because you're flying a plane and there's people on it, yeah. your team. And if you can actually tell your team, here's where we're at, here's what we did last month, here's what we plan to do next month, here's what we did last quarter, here's our plan for next quarter, here's last year to remind everybody of what we did last year, and here's the goal again, I'm going to restate the goal for the 17th time, the <laughs> goal for 2018 is X. Right. I find that those moments just make everybody on the team feel more secure. Totally. Okay, this is a pilot. The pilots of this plane are paying attention to the altitude. You know? I talked to a founder recently, he's not a part of our portfolio, but a company I really like who, uh, and I'm not advocating this for everybody, but I thought it was interesting. She writes a vision statement each mm. quarter, basically sort of reflecting, and it's one page, it's not mm. you know super long, but sort of saying, this is what we accomplished, this is what I think we can do better, this is what I can do better, mm. this is what I hope we do together this quarter. And she's gotten so much positive feedback. I've heard from members of her team even that, you know, it's just a way to galvanize everybody and make sure they're on the same page because you're all going a mile a minute. You don't necessarily understand what that person over there in the corner is doing and how it relates necessarily to yeah. your day-to-day -day job. So um, again, I'm not saying all companies need to do that, but finding ways to communicate with your team so you're all on the same page is definitely important. And a little vulnerability in a leader is actually admirable. It's It shows some self-awareness. Nobody's perfect. No. So if the leader says, hey, listen, here's what I could have done better, and I could have given a little bit clearer goals, and I could have communicated this better, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try one more time communicating this because I didn't do such a great job. Oh, boy, wow, that's somebody you want to... You, you're going to have even more trust in, and you're going to be even more in love with working for because then if something really hard does happen, you know this person's gonna be honest and they're gonna to reflect. Totally, and also just repeating yourself, I think is important. I think oh God, we all yes. like to think that we're the center of the universe and everything that you say is caught by every social media you know, yeah. viewer and everything, but it's really not. I had a boss who always said, you know, show them the fish, hit them with the fish and then show them the fish again. Yeah. And you know, I think it's very <laughs> basic, but it's true, you know, you have to keep uh, hammering away at your core values and your core priorities because they're I'm just important. picturing somebody with a Branzino. This <laughs> is a Branzino. Yeah. Whack. <laughs> Did you feel the Branzino? <laughs> it's definitely a Branzino. Yeah. Um, or a Loop de Mer, whichever you prefer. <laughs> um, let's talk about a winner. There's got to be a company that you just, when you think about them, you get those pins and needles and you're just like, oh my God. I'm so proud of this company. I have one right now I could yeah. share, but I'll go, I'll go with yours first. We have a bunch. I'll give you one and maybe I'll give you all of them. But yeah, um, go for it. So we have a company right now that we're super pumped on called Votes. Votes. They're, they're a mobile voting platform built on the blockchain. Oh my goodness. Um, and the idea being, you know, when you think about what's wrong with voting here in the US in particular, people usually point to two things. One, people don't do it. Mm. Um, and two, people feel really unsure about the security, you know, is Russia tampering with our elections, et cetera. Um, so the idea is, you know, can you do it 
mobily, so more people are likely to participate, but also do it on the blockchain in a way that's super secure and auditable. Amazing. Um, and they've been able to sell, I mean, they're selling to uh, statewide Democratic and Republican parties, a lot of townships and uh, cities, especially their their core market, at least initially, is on the East Coast, mm-hmm. especially in New England, where there are a lot of uh, towns that do regular town voting. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it gets pretty tedious after a while when you're doing participatory voting or budgeting. Um, and so they've they've really engaged with this product and we just love the team and, and think that they're doing something really interesting with the technology. I think people are talking a lot about, but I think a lot of people are sort of enamored with blockchain, say for blockchain. That's not kind of how we think of our investments. It's much more, you know, how is this technology serving the larger vision of the company? And for them, it's about getting people to vote and feel confident about that voting process. Yeah, if you could increase participation rates alone, that would be dramatic. Totally. And if people felt that their vote counted and was physically on a blockchain somewhere and they could point to it and say... Yes, your vote is right there, right. clear as day. You voted for X and you voted for Y and Z on this ballot measures because ballot measures are becoming more popular. Huge. And so they can, what I love about that idea is they, they don't have to get the presidential election. Yeah, but they, they will. Can, they will eventually. I mean, it's, it's obvious that that's where we need to go. And the ability to vote and have a two-week window, I mean, this allows for, gosh, the convenience of it being on your phone, but also maybe, you know a seven day window to vote and to really take in the issues and to consider them, it's much better for democracy. Um, We're excited because it's not just, of course it has relevance for for government elections, but also think about corporate voting, Mm -hmm. shareholder voting. Absolutely. Um, They've had a lot of uh, university campuses that do a lot of voting and they've they've embraced the technology. Tufts is one of them. Um, So it's cool to see that, you know, people do this all the time or should be doing it. Can we make this easier? And, And so we're really excited about them. And what I hear in that is when you think of the blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies, you're not attracted to the uh, speculation of it, but the application of it. Totally. Is there anything, what do you think of this since we're here sitting here in (laughs) January of 2018 and Bitcoin's lost half its value after, you know, going up 10x last year. Now it's down 50% in a month. Yeah. What is your take on this insanity that we're seeing where ICOs and other cryptocurrencies are actually being used as a proxy or as a replacement rather for raising capital. Some people in the crypto community say it's the end of venture capital. We're going to destroy venture capital. People are going to, a bunch of civilians around the world are going to buy tokens and that's going to change the need to raise venture capital. You buy that? No. I mean, it's definitely like a tool in the toolkit that, you know, entrepreneurs can embrace. Uh, My co-founder Julie says it well. I think she basically when we get pitched by companies who are saying like, and in addition, we're doing an ICO, <laughs> it's sort of um, building a business within the business. It's a lot of work <laughs> yeah. to ha- to sort of issue your own currency or, you know, yeah. go through the ICO process. And you have thousands of people then who expect a lot from you. And it's not oftentimes super aligned with the sort of core nature of your business. And mm. even if it is, it's just, it's just a, it's a bitch. It's a lot of work. Yeah. And so I think people need to take it really seriously. It doesn't mean there aren't really relevant applications, but we haven't found one yet. Hmm. Um, you know, we haven't seen a company where we felt that their ICO opportunity was compelling to us just because it seemed more like a distraction from the business they actually said they wanted to do. That to me seems like the big sin of a lot of founders right now is they're getting this FOMA, this fear of missing out on this quick, easy ICO money. So they come up with some way to bolt it onto their business. Right. And they're not taking into account that if people give you money, they're explicitly expecting it to appreciate. Right. Now you've got a thousand or ten thousand people who've bought these tokens and they're not buying it for the utility. That's the big farce here. Like nobody is buying these tokens because they want to play Centipede or, you know, Defender (laughs) or Asteroids. This is not Chuck E. Cheese. Right. They're buying the tokens because, okay, you say there's going to be some utility of them. Okay, great. They're going to be, you know, you're going to disintermediate Uber or Airbnb with these tokens. Great. I want the token to go up. And when the chickens come home to roost on this one, I predict that people are going to go to jail. I mean, all it takes is one attorney general from Kentucky, from Houston, from Arizona, who says, you know what? People, three of my constituents lost their money from some city slicker 
in San Francisco who did this ICO, I'm going to I'm going to shellac them. <laughs> I'm going to show them that they cannot break securities law in the grand state of Louisiana. And man, it's going to be ugly because you will get pulled down to Louisiana and they will arrest you. Totally. I mean, and they're not nec- they're not wrong. I mean, I think th- these are securities. I'm regulated as an investor. I think, you know, if you're going to be putting other people's money at risk, you need to take responsibility for that. So we'll see what happens. I, th- I think that's like, it's so clear to you and I, and I'm like looking at this going like, why don't I have a billion dollar coin? Where's my J coin? Right, I dude, could see you doing that. I'm going to do a J coin. I don't know what it's going to do. Something good. Something incredible <laughs> is going to come out of J coin. Okay. <laughs> Tell me another winner. Something that gives you tingles when you think about it. This uh, is your chance to promote. See, on most yeah, podcasts, right? people are like, oh, promoting your thing. You know. Yeah. How did you meet the votes, by the way? Did that, was that a cold uh, they email? They were pitching at a competition oh. in Massachusetts. In um, Massachusetts? We spend oh. a lot of time sort of seeking out entrepreneurs in different parts of the country. About mm. two-thirds of the deals we look at come from outside of the Bay Area. So mm. we try to sort of be pretty explicit about, you know, showing up at pitch competitions in different parts of the country, like wow. getting to know university programs, you know, sometimes just around general entrepreneurship, but sometimes it's about, you know, specific themes we're interested in, like mobility. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, we, we met them at a pitch competition. Great entrepreneur can come from anywhere. Anywhere. Do you then try to get them to move here? No. No. Uh, you think a great company can be built anywhere as well now? Yeah. I mean, for us, we want to stay in close communication. And so it's helpful to have a company here because we can see them in person. We can yeah. get to know their team, but we're not going to make a company move here. We we can do Zoom calls and that works out yeah. just fine. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, operating in a, in a community where there's a pretty strong entrepreneurial ecosystem, I would say Boston is definitely one of those places. Yeah. You can you can be super successful. Um, mm. Sometimes it helps to be in one of those places as opposed to, say, some really random, you know, obscure rural community. Um, but it's not to say you can't do it there, too. Yeah, it seems like there's enough tech talent in Austin, Boston, New York, Los Angeles, San Diego, Seattle, you know, this, this critical mass. Totally. What about those, like, say, next level of cities? It's, it's just a little harder, doesn't it? It's certainly harder, but yeah. I think for us, we're looking for undervalued deals. And mm. so, you know, we want to find them wherever we can find them. Um, and, you know, we want to have a differentiated thesis and we want to achieve alpha. And that means investing in things that other people are not investing in. Right. Um, and so we, we, we try to really be as expansive as possible. And the valuations will be three, four, five million dollars in those communities. And the valuations here will be eight, nine, and ten. So you'll yeah. be getting in at half price or a third of the price for similar performance. And is that about your estimation? Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, that's one of the things I find interesting is being, and I've tried to do this with our incubators, being the sort of Ellis Island of Silicon Valley. Like, yeah, you're from Hong Kong, you're from Seattle, but come spend twelve weeks with us. You can go back after, or you can create an office here or a headquarters here, but. I think the high art is going to be in the future, having your headquarters here or a presence here, Yeah, almost making it look like you're here, but then having everything else somewhere where the cost of living is, you know, Vancouver level or Toronto or Quebec or Florida, maybe not Florida. (laughs) It's warm there. Yeah, that's the problem. It's too warm <laughs> and nobody wants to do any work. Give me another company that gives you the tingles when you uh, think about it. I'll, list a, I'll give you a company that, because we talked to them today and I'm super yeah. excited. They're called Ethic. Ethic. They're um, a software platform that builds these really sophisticated um, public equities portfolios for institutional asset managers with the sustainability lens. Ah. So the idea is right now, if you want to invest in the public equity space, but say you, you don't want to invest in weapons or you don't want to invest in tobacco or you mm. want to say like I have this big portfolio I want at least two thirds of it to have at least one woman on the board of those companies Ooh. There, there's infinite permutations when you, I say sustainability I might mean corporate governance you might mean the oceans human rights whatever whatever it might be yeah. um, and you may have eight of those things that you want all of them um, and right now it's it's almost impossible to sort of manually build that those types wow. of portfolios but using big data and these are these guys all came out of uh, men and women came out of um, the banking sector Folks. 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 Yeah. And they're amazing. We, we, their product is gorgeous. They have some really amazing customers and the idea of being able to sort of achieve this kind of goal at scale, mm. you know, moving billions of dollars, um, towards whatever you might believe to be is impactful to us is really exciting. Like that's what we're looking for. We want, we want meaningful solutions at scale. And so for us, we're, we're really excited about them. And so they'll build those portfolios. Correct. And, and execute on those trades. 
Wow. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like they're a vanguard where they make uh, a portfolio for you custom or for everybody? For you custom. I mean, they Uh, they work with some asset managers and they'll say like, we're going to build this signature portfolio for you as a firm. But they mm -hmm. also will say, you know, we're we're empowering you as asset managers to build customized portfolios in front of someone's eyes like that Mm -hmm. um, for all of your customers. It'd be amazing if they had just... Um, like you can buy QQQQ, like the NASDAQ index fund. If yeah. they actually made those funds and they became traded funds and then you could buy a share totally. of the, you know, boards with women on them, Yeah, you know, and, or just human rights level one, yeah, you know, and level two, but not level three and four. Right. And so there's like a, a way to move up in that stack rank and say, this is a human rights, and just a conscious company. Yeah. Maybe there's some way to say it, like a conscious company, level one, two, three, and four, and they could have level one, level two, level three, level four, and you could just say, I'm going to put in my portfolio 50% to level one, yeah. 25% to level two, and 10% and whatever, 15% to the other two. And The amazing thing is the, because they have access to this massive amount of information and the program is so elegant that they'll actually track to market performance. So it's not like you have to say like, oh, I'm, I'm forgoing, you know, Returns. this level of impact because uh, I need this level of return. They, they, they are able to build these portfolios, which is pretty awesome. I mean, there are some like exchange traded funds that have impact like uh, carbon as mm. a, you know, low carbon fund that, that do exist. But I think the thing is they're, they're inherently not flexible. Um, and if you get like th- three people together, they're going to have five opinions. So, you know, they're all going to want something different. Um, and if you look at what's in them, sometimes it's pretty gross. Like you'll see like an Exxon in there and you're thinking, what is that doing in there? But it's, oh, they've made some significant investment in the wind space and that's great, but that's not, you know, when I was thinking I'm investing in low carbon, that's not what I envisioned. Yeah. Not exactly (laughs) Exxon when I said I wanted to stop greenhouse gas. (laughs) So anyway, we, that, that company also gives my my heart the flutters. Yeah. It's, you know what I love is when you get unknown great news. You referred to it before. What's a company that just all of a sudden blossomed that was just an unexpected, incredible moment for you guys? Yeah. Um, well, so we had a company recently, they're called Apana. They're a oh. hardware and software solution for large commercial and industrial customers that have big water bills. Ah. It's a very sexy space. Yes. Uh, so like sexy. their customers are like Costco, like those types sure. of entities that use a lot of water and need to reduce their water mm-hmm. use um, for either regulatory reasons or cost reasons. Um, and so they've helped Costco reduce their water use. They started with a pilot. When we invested, I think like a pilot of maybe 50 Costco's, they helped them reduce their water use by 23%, which is Gigantic, Huge. yeah. Um, and so after we made our initial investment, we found out recently that they are now expanding to every Costco in North America, which mm. was like a, they're now, their revenue numbers are, are much higher than we had anticipated. Yeah. Um, and so that was a really, a bit of great news that we were really excited about. They're now expanding to Japan, which is pretty cool. Hey, uh, women are in the news a bunch and this whole, so much, so much and this venture capital thing, uh, the numbers are pretty bleak in terms of when you started five years ago. Yep. The number of female investors was low single digits, I believe. Mm-hmm. We've gotten up a little bit since then, which is nice to see. Um, what do you think the state of female investors is today? And has it gotten better? And do you feel like we've turned a corner in the industry? Or do you feel it's just a lot more to go? Both. I mean, yeah. I think we, we are starting to move in the right direction, but yeah. there's still a long way to go. I think on the one hand, it's a really painful time. I think there are a lot of revelations that just yeah. they are not nice to read. They're, they Brutal, are yeah. pretty disheartening. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, I feel like people are really open to talking about this issue in a way I've never heard before. Yeah. And so for me, you know, it's really exciting. It's, it's a great time to be in the industry. We feel like Um, you know, we've built this firm ourselves. We are intentionally creating a great place to work. We are investing in as many interesting and different types of founders as we can find. And so, um, you know, we definitely have LPs that support what we're doing. And I definitely think you're hearing more people sort of say, yes, I want to do better. I want to think about this issue. And, and that's, I think all you can, you can ask. Yeah. It's, it's pretty amazing. The number of female led firms now. And I think that's really the indicator that's encouraging to me is that women aren't just trying to become the seventh partner at whatever firm that's never had a female partner. Right. I mean, it's great that they're adding female partners, of course, but 
a bigger jump and a bigger step function is when folks like yourself or Alien Lee, who came before you, say, well, I'm just going to start my own firm. Yeah. I, I don't need to go work for somebody else. I'm going to found my own firm and, you know, other folks who have done that. I think it's just amazing. Um, it'd be great to see more of the very affluent women becoming LPs in these funds too. And yeah, I've heard this, cri- I've heard this criticism before. And yeah, and is it valid or no? Yes. I mean, is, yeah. I, I can only speculate as to why it is. I've heard people speculate that yeah. it's, you know, women are very active investors in other sectors, whether it be the public markets or real huh. estate or, you yeah. know, and this is just not a sector where they've played traditionally maybe, hmm. or perhaps it is that, you know, so much of being a successful LP is getting sort of inside recommendations and you need to have a peer set that's sort of active in the technology space. And maybe some hmm. folks feel like they don't have that. I, I can't even begin to yeah. pinpoint why it is, but it's definitely most of our LPs are, are men. Although I have to say some of, uh, most of our institutional LPs are, are women led, which is pretty cool. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow. A lot of foundations, yeah. hospital systems, sure. you know, you see the, the sort of chief investment officers of, of those types of firms, lots of women on the team, and it's been yeah. so great to work with them. Yeah, it's, it's, it definitely feels like there's something turning a corner, and I'm speaking specifically not of the Me Too movement, but the specifically like the investment movement and the number of female investors, because it, if the number of people in the number of female investors go up, like you said, there's just so many blind spots that men don't even know they have. Men can't understand a lot of these markets. They don't understand them. And I think they, it's by definition, a blind spot is just something you can't understand or see. So they don't even know that they're missing an opportunity. And I think a lot of the opportunities you're going to find are things that men just, just doesn't even come into their consciousness. Knock on wood. We'll yeah. see what happens. I mean, we're a hundred percent woman fund. So Amazing. Julie and I are women, our associates a woman. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. We'll continue success with it. What's the best way for somebody to get on your radar? If you had to list like say three things in order, I'll yeah. give you a second to think about it, but the three things in order that increase the likelihood of somebody say getting that meeting, which is really what founders want. They want to get that meeting because you, you can't get the check until you get the meeting and the meeting is really the, the, I think the important part, what's, what are the three things that make it the right time or the right person or the right vertical for you guys? I mean, for us, it's about demonstrating momentum. Mm. And so that's what really what we look for, for the companies that we talk to in terms of like actually just having an initial conversation with us. We love to start with an in-person conversation. So Mm. we post all the events where we're speaking on our website so people can come and meet me or Julie or our associate May in person. And that for us is a big part of what we look for is sort of tenacity and wanting to come and find us within right. reason. Right. Um, you don't need to be outside don't the Don't show building. up in my house. <laughs> yeah, that's not good. No. Um, but th- that, I mean, that hustle's good, but showing out, you have to be self-aware to understand. Good. Judgment also good. Yeah. 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 So that's a good way. And then just, you know, I'm, I'm on Twitter all the time. I don't tweet a super amount, but I'm on all the time. And yeah. so, uh, you know, messaging me on there, I, I will see it. Yeah. I always think that people... What the big mistake, the cardinal mistake, um, founders when they're trying to reach out to investors is they don't do their homework about understanding what this person invests in, yeah, and at what stage they invest in. And so, for somebody to come to you with just an idea and say, How is my idea? yeah, that's not what you do, you're not an idea evaluator of back of the napkin, you know, ideas, yeah. So, and writing a six page email of all your different ideas, like if the number, the population that has ideas is 100% of the population, right? like the population of people sleeping yeah. with ideas is probably 50% are dreaming. So they technically have ideas. So like you really have to understand this person invests in urban startups. And it's one of the reasons why we started Angel Podcast was just so people understand this is the right investor for you right. at this time. I mean, I would say uh, on one point um, in terms of like six page emails, we have a sort of rule in our office that we try to stick to, which is we don't write emails longer than six sentences unless someone specifically asked us for like a long form answer to something. Yeah. Um, I definitely encourage all humans to do that. Six Nobody sentences wants to, or less. Well, I, I mean, like it. how much could you possibly need to say or put in an attachment? Um, yeah. That's one thing. Second thing, I always bring a deck. It drives me crazy when entrepreneurs want to just sort of sit down and chat. And I say, like, are you sure you don't want to go through the deck? And they're like, no, we'll just freewheel it. And yeah. those 
conversations tend to be much more scattered. Mm. I understand that like building a rapport is important and we don't have to stick to the deck the entire time, but I don't think entrepreneurs want to just sort of expound on whatever it is they want to expound on. And sometimes it's helpful to say like on page one, this is our mission or page two, this is our traction. It keeps me engaged and kind of focused on what you're doing. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't take advantage of that opportunity. It, it shows you're able at the very, the deck has been derided. Yeah. Because sometimes people build a deck instead of a product. Correct. But having a great product and a great deck that is succinct and well-structured, it's almost like your thesis. It's here is why I'm doing this. Here is the grand plan. Here's why it's important. It shows you're able to, at least in 15 pages or so, explain to somebody efficiently and anticipate every question they're going to have or most questions are going to have. So you're starting on third base when the discussion starts. Absolutely. And there's some investors who hate decks and will never look at them in a meeting and that's okay. But I think many people, including myself, yeah. like having that sort of structure to the conversation so it doesn't get like wildly off base. I think this is another thing where knowing your audience is so key. Like if you're a founder, the best thing to say to an investor, and this is the, what I tell them when they say, what should I do in a meeting? I say, Ask the investor, what would be most productive for you? Would you like me to run through the deck quickly? Um, I have a longer deck I could go through, uh, or I could do a product demo, or we could just talk. What works best for you in terms of order? Totally. And people are like, oh, um, well, why don't you run through the long deck? Yeah, I'd like to see the long deck. Yeah. yeah. Like, I have a 10-side deck, and I have a 30-side deck. That's such a power move. Would you like me to go through the 10-side deck or the 30? It's like, no, I want the 30. Yeah. Now they've opted in to going deeper into your business. Congratulations. You've just like unlocked like uh, a huge win for yourself. Totally. I mean, I think generally knowing your audience and also doing some research on who they are hmm. is super important regardless of like when we pitch investors, we do the same thing. Humans are humans. They want to feel important and they want to have a conversation where it's not me justifying myself the whole time. Like, well, this is what our fund does. And you know, it's, you should know that have time. We have a website, look at it Yeah, and we'll use this hour together for productive conversation. Yeah. It's like, if you, if you haven't researched the company, I, sometimes I'll get a cold email. You probably have this happen as well, where you get a cold email where the person's telling you about their medical device company in South America Yeah, that is raising $40 million. And you're like, Okay, I don't invest in, I only invest in, nor, in North America. Right. I invest in technology companies, but not biotech or medical devices. And I'm a seed stage investor, so 40 million is slightly outside of my check size. Yeah. I mean, it's hard because we also want to be as expansive as possible mm. in that, you know, when we say urban, that means many things. It could be yeah. fintech, it could be voting, it could be, you know, education, you know, it could be so many things. And so we don't want to exclude, like, mm. we don't want people to think like, oh, that's not me, you know, I'd rather than say, oh, that could be me. And mm. then me have to tell them it's not, you know, I think for us, we're looking for the best deals and, and w like we have companies in our portfolio that don't actively identify as urban and that's fine. Mm. You know, they actively identify as a transportation company as, right. as they should. Um, and it's for me to sort of say this fits within my vision of yeah. what urban is. And so it's kind of a, a delicate balance of saying like, if you're not sure you should pitch yeah. me. I mean, we've gone to the length of actually putting on our website, like these are the nine verticals that we are most excited about um, and why right. so that hopefully entrepreneurs who are curious or not sure can kind of say, ah, yes, that's me. Okay. Cra this will end on this craziest pitch, <laughs> like most outlandish. Yeah. And then I'll give you mine or I can give you mine while you think of yours. The pitches that are crazy that we see tend to be like, uh, we're solving homelessness, you know, like, like yeah. really expansive. Sure. Um, not like. Not Maybe crazy like, is the wrong word, but the yeah. most outlandish or, you know, what's the generous way to say it? I mean, for the most fascinating, the most fascinating. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, it's a lot of those like really over the top, you know, like we're going to solve homelessness, but we're a mattress company, you know, like yeah. those types of things we see a lot. We've definitely had some folks be pretty inappropriate with members delusional? of our team. Oh, inappropriate? Oh, yeah, inappropriate. But also, yeah, we've had oh. the delusional. I mean, everybody gets the delusional, like we're raising $80 million and you're like, what have you done? And the <laughs> answer is nothing. Yeah. You know, it, there are plenty of crazy stories out there. The most expansive one I had recently yeah. was, and I took the meeting because I knew, I think Peter Thiel had invested in the last round. So I was like, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Was for using psilocybin, which is the active um, chemical in magic mushrooms. Yeah. 
to cure depression or PTSD. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's fascinating. And that was a really interesting meeting where they're literally, they create synthetic psilocybin. It's in Europe. And then they give you an IV drip. Yeah. That's your a, thing now. That's which your... is my thing. I'm taking <laughs> IV drips now because I've been sick. But, um, and they, I asked some, this was the fantastical part of it. I was like, so what, what is the dose that you give people? And they said, oh, it's a heroic dose. And I said, what's a heroic dose? And I guess that's like a 60s thing, thing like a heroic dose. And they said, that'd be like a bag of mushrooms, like a giant bag of mushrooms. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, what happens? It's like, oh yeah, no, people are knocked out. They're just Yeah, well, you're, you're not depressed. You're just like passed out. You're blissed <laughs> out, yeah. So I thought that was pretty interesting. But the one that was the most dystopian was... Somebody was trying to make an AI to be an AI therapist. Interesting. Where it would almost like, you know, the little Siri cartoon when you say, hey, Siri. Sorry, everybody who's listening on their speaker. Hey, Siri. Um, and it, you know, makes the rainbow go up and down. Yeah. And you see the wavelength. It was sort of like that. It was like this little sentient being on your phone and you would tap it to tell it how you were feeling. And the idea was over time, it would learn how you're feeling and try to make you feel better. Yeah. And I just thought this is the most millennial, insane idea. Like the goal of life is not to feel, you know, happiness exclusively. Right. And I said to the person, like, any background in psychology? No, of course not. None. And I was thinking... You're making an AI to make people happy. You have literally nobody on the team who's a therapist or psychologist or has any yeah. depth in this field. Like this is where having, there's a time when being fresh eyes on a subject matter is good. Right. If you're Airbnb or Uber or Lyft and you've never worked at a cab company or never worked at a hotel, sure, maybe that's helpful because you can think outside the box. But in therapy, to be a neophyte, it's I don't know if that's helpful. Well, okay, so we've invested in a company that we are excited about. Well, you invested in, in this company? No, 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 no. no. Um, it's called Stop, Breathe, and Think. Okay. It's essentially a mindfulness and meditation and mental health tool Fantastic. for kids and young people. Sure. Um, and, you know, there, there are so many ways that, like, simple technology prompts can Absolutely. engage people and especially kids who are so used to using these types of tools and I think can be super productive. They obviously have people on the team who are super experts in this space. And yeah. I definitely think, especially if you're dealing with children, that's really important. Yeah. Um, and so, mental health. Of and children. mental health. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I definitely think there are, there are ways in which you can operate in that space and do a lot of good. Yeah. But I think being realistic about what your limitations are, if you have no background yeah. in that space, certainly. It's like good. there now that we're operating in the real world as yeah. Silicon Valley is in the technology industry, it's not just making like enterprise software or video games. You're, you're actually operating in the real world, self-driving cars, autonomous cars, you know, flights, quadcopters, you know, drones, whatever, people's health. You really have to start thinking about, well, what if I get it wrong? Right. I mean, if you look at Facebook, what if I get it wrong might have been the election and Russia interfering with it, or might be, I don't know, millions or tens of millions of people being addicted to this and being depressed or anxious because of social media. Totally. I think it all goes back, like we were saying earlier, this idea of culture, being intentional, whatever it mm. is, whatever type of business you're building, you don't all have to build the same type of company, but whether it's thinking about gender diversity or the like long-term implications of your uh, you know, mushroom injection yeah. product, I, I think those are, those think are important. Think it through. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's interesting when you look back on the history of Facebook, there was like every signal that the company did not act, was not thoughtful. Move fast, break things was their philosophy and just remove any type of resistance, you know, or friction from the product in order to get people more addicted to it. Right. To the point at which the former founders and founding team are now saying like, I can't believe what we built. We should have really thought this through. Right. And now the founder coming out and saying, yeah, we've got a really existential crisis on our hands. We have to change the way this product works because we're damaging people. Totally. And I think those ethical questions are important and investors don't often deal with them. We've actually been dealing with a few of those lately where companies where we're like, this is definitely going to be huge. We know this company is going to be enormous and we actually really like the team, but there's some ethical question we can't get past. Like, is this good for the world, uh -huh. you know, we're, whether you're a mission driven investor or not, just sort of saying, is this actually evil or could it be used in a really nefarious way yeah. is a legitimate question. And we actually couldn't resolve 
ourselves on a company that we all loved. Mm. Um, and I think that that's, that's hard. That's hard to deal with when you know, sort of, I think this is going to be big, but I don't, I don't think we can be a part of it. Or maybe you say, actually, we, we want to be a part of it because as board members, we can help them make these difficult decisions, which in, inevitably uh, arise. Uh, anyway, I think that's, I think that's important for investors to, to think seriously about. See, I think that's the interesting one because it's the classic is not funding the right move or engaging right. and trying to steer the right better. and make it better. And a lot of times you don't have much of a choice, do you? You've invested and then the thing comes off the rails or something goes wrong. And now you are in this very awkward, precarious position because you don't run the company. You don't have a controlling interest. You don't even have a board seat or you don't have, or you have one of 12 board seats or whatever right. it is. You don't have the actual ability to say to the founder, you cannot do this. This has to stop. Right. And, but the world says, well, you're the investor in it. You created this monster. Right. You know, it's, now what? <laughs> it's tough. It's yeah. tough. I don't think we have a like hard and fast rule on it, but it's something we've been thinking about a lot recently, especially yeah. around data companies. Yeah, the data companies really have, and this is where I think there's going to be a huge opportunity in this next wave of companies to maybe create, and this is where I think crypto actually maybe has something interesting to offer, a Facebook or a Twitter based on crypto where there was some inherent currency other than advertising and selling people's data. Yeah. People could opt in or opt out of it. And maybe the company doesn't have to be a $250 billion or $500 billion company. Maybe it could be a smaller company with a different revenue footprint and a different philosophy of people's information. We'll see what happens. Yeah, it's crazy. All right, listen, Clara Brenner, uh, it's been great to get to know you over these years and continued success with the Urban Innovation Fund. You can go to urbaninnovationfund.com and you can follow Clara underscore Brenner on the Twitter where she is, are you addicted to it? No, Julie's addicted to it. Okay. Julie is super addicted to it. I'm addicted to Instagram, but <gasps> I know. Oh, you're a double click and swipe up person. Yeah, exactly. I do a lot of uh, bookmarking. Oh, you bookmark bookmarking a lot of why? Are you you need that photo for later? I yeah. never understood that. Yeah, I consult them later. You literally consult the photos later. Yes, I do. For what purpose? Like, I, I love know. those shoes, or yeah, or like I'm or, decorating my house, or oh, I see. Okay, or, but like maybe a pin board. But it could be an inspirational quote, or oh, some company that I'm interested in. But I, I never I can't knew who that feature was that for. Later, it's like, oh, I really like that company that you just mentioned. I don't have time to look at it now, but I'm on I'll look the brink right now of literally asking Emmy Award winning producer Jackie to change my passwords. So you don't go on and not give them back to me. Do you that's remember in wrong. Young Frankenstein? Yeah, that's you ever see Young Frankenstein? I did. And he says, no matter what I say, do not let me out of that room. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. It's not a no, bad idea. No matter what I say, do not give me my passwords. I will only use Buffer to post to them, but I will not read them. Because right now, with this Mueller investigation yeah. and the world going insane. insane, I am finding myself, I wake up, Clara, and I look at my phone. Yeah. And... Just the other day, I, I I think I crossed the rubric. Like, this is the end. Too, an, too much? Well, instead of looking at, like, 30 SMSs that had built up during my flu, yeah. I went to trending topics on Twitter. See, my and husband like, does this. He wakes up in the middle of the night, and he'll checks. be like, oh, I, I just, you know, went to the bathroom, and then I checked it, and then he's up for three hours. <sighs> and then he's tired, and you wonder why. It's because this machine was running your life. Yeah. I See, this is what Apple needs to do. This is a message Tim Cook. If Apple put a timeout on the device yeah. where I said, hey, listen, I want per app, I want to set my own cap as an adult. Right. I want to say no more than 30 minutes of Twitter a day and no more than two hours of total phone time a day. Right. Period. And just good. block it. This would be an incredible app. Yes. Somebody should make this. I don't think you can make that on a closed system. On the Android system, you can make it. All right, listen, great guest. Uh, I, I'm going to seek <laughs> professional help. I think it's a startup opportunity. Honestly, like, get me off of the these. It's so addicting. I don't think I've ever been addicted to anything like social media. Yeah. And I, this Trump phenomenon, I think, has exacerbated it in everybody. I avoided it for a long time, and now I've sort of plunged into it. In a self-loathing kind of way. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. I feel like you're getting in at the right time. Yeah. See, like, Things I think you're coming in, like, up. right at the crescendo. That's, yeah. Where it's, like, Bannon's being, you know. Yeah. How many he's being, he's going to testify before this group, that group. I mean, this whole thing, the Michael Wolf book. Yeah. This it's whole, exciting. It's all coming down. 
It's right? how I can watch movies like The Post and not feel depressed at the moment. That was a great movie. So great. I love The Post. Loved it. I, I really like this film season. I like the, the Shape of Water. I haven't seen it yet. Amazing. Uh, three Billboards, also very good. Mm -hmm. Lady Bird, excellent. So many good, Star Wars, not so much. Blade Runner, yes. I mean, but it was a good season. All right, we'll see everybody next. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we just want to, I always tell everybody, this is the last 10 minutes, and, you know, it's just going to go off the rails. It's the best All right. part. Yeah, it's the best part. All right, we'll see you next time on angelpodcast.com. Bye-bye.